Now comes the history part, okay? And depending on who you talk to, there's always a conflict of the history because there are two words in the Bible in the book of Genesis that messes up everything. And you have to understand at the time in which it was translated, uh, the word is Ramses. And when the children of Israel traveled, uh, uh, was traveling out of Egypt, going to the promised land, Okay, they passed by the way that is called Ramses. So Ramses reigned roughly about 1200 BC, but Ram, you know, Egyptians have this annoying habit of erasing people's names. So they changed the name of the city where Ramses is or was located. They changed it from A-V-A-R-I-S to Ramses. So before it was Ramses, it was Avaris. You're with me. Okay, so they traveled through. So you have to figure out that if Moses was around 1400 B.C., not 1200, but 1400 B.C., they were in the wilderness for 40 years. So that means they came out of the Egypt 1440 approximately or more B.C. So this is where I'm starting. So here on the backside of the desert, in the mountain of Sinai, you find Moses getting the instructions from the Lord. That's the first writing. What is interesting is, is that in speaking with certain rabbis that I speak with, um, in regards to the Old Testament, we have um, the first five books, which is called the Torah. The interesting thing about the Torah is the fact that we, um, if you can go to slide two, we have here the culmination, the next one please, we have the culmination of the Hebrew canon. You have the Torah, which consists of the five books. And the five books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The funny thing about it is they were comprised into five books prior to or during the intertestament times. But before that, they were separate. Now, it's quite interesting. When you read the books of 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, and even 1 and 2 Samuel, but especially, I want to bring emphasis on this, it's out of convenience that they have the first five books because during the intertestament time, it was a lot to carry. And when they came back from Babylon in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, that's when it became five books. But before that, they were scrolls. They were large scrolls. And Exodus in chapter 25 speaks of the building of the tabernacle. So when they were traveling, they had to get the plan right and lay everything down so they had to get that particular scroll. If the, the feast in the book of Leviticus, whenever the feast came about, they had to get that particular scroll and so forth and so on. So roughly between the time of uh, 1400 BC, okay, they were operating in different scrolls and they had the tabernacle. Are you with me? Okay, here we go. So, now, the name of the Old Testament reflects Christianity's understanding of itself as a fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy of the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31. Okay, now when Jeremiah gets to chapter 31, that's roughly about 588, not yet the total destruction of the um, temple, okay? So, but when Jesus sits down with the... Uh, 12 disciples in the in the upper room and he's having the Last Supper he talks about a new covenant so what he's doing is he's transferring that ownership that exclusive exclusivity that the Jews had and he's grafting the body of Christ the Gentile in the Old Testament is a Hebrew scripture of the Tanaka 
Now, the Tanaka is an acronym for the Hebrew word. You've got the Torah. You've got the Nevi'im. You have the, Lord help me, Hagographia and the Kethuvim. These threefold divisions speaks of the whole Old Testament that we have. Now, one of the things about the Bible, and I'm going to get into it, it's quite hilarious, is that people talk about the lost books of the Bible. People talk about the Apocrypha, that it needs to be in the Bible. But I'll put it to you like this. If the Jews did not think they was inspiring, why should we? Because it's all about, the, the, that, that section is just about Jewish history. The, the things that's quite interesting and mind-boggling is the ancient writings that go further back. Now, you cannot and you should not, and a lot of people do, uh, but you shouldn't do it. But a lot of people do. But you shouldn't do it. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the writings of the ancient, ancient Assyrians, because there are, there are two different types of Assyrians. There is the ancient Assyrian, and then there's the Neo-Assyrian. There's the ancient Babylon, and then there's the Neo-Babylon. The ancient Assyrians are the Assyrians in Genesis chapter 10, when Nimrod, okay, built these cities. That's the ancient. The Tower of Babel, that's the ancient. The Neo-Babylon is Nebuchadnezzar. And Neo means new. But it's quite interesting. He's just not Nebuchadnezzar. He has a number behind his name. He is Nebuchadnezzar, like Elder Cooper too. He's Nebuchadnezzar the second. Okay, so that means there was another Nebuchadnezzar before him. But in all of this, God existed before Nimrod. God existed before Nebuchadnezzar. In the Bible, God existed before uh, Sennacherib. God existed before uh, Nimrod and Sennacherib. If you know history of the Assyrians, Sargon and all the rest of them. He existed. So don't compare what they wrote to what Moses wrote. Okay? You can't do that. All right? Now, and the reason being is because just because they wrote it and they wrote their story of the creation in stone and it lasts, and Moses wrote his, but he got it from God, who is eternally existing in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. You see, you, you've got to, un, when you read the Bible, you've got to believe the first verse before you go to the second. When you open it up, in the beginning, God. And that's where it all starts. Okay? So the Old Testament is there. And then uh, the writings of the Old Testament of the Bible were preserved in three languages. And just like uh, Pastor Stone had said, you know, it was preserved. And again, it's, it's, it's really interesting, and we overlook it when you understand it, but I'm going to talk about it. It's Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and have been passed on to us mainly through manuscripts. And I'm jumping ahead, but the Greek Septuagint, that was done in Alexandria, and then the newly discovered or the discovered Dead Sea Scrolls of the Essenes and the Mesoric Hebrew texts of Tiberius and Galilee and so forth like that. The Old Testament consists of mainly distinct books by various authors produced over a period of centuries. Okay, now we take it, I'm dealing with the Old Testament now, and we divide it up into, you got the five books, which is called the Torah, Hebrew, Pentateuch, Greek, okay? And then the history of the books telling of the Israelites from their conquest of Canaan to their defeat and exile in Babylon. So that's the conquest of Canaan is Judges to the defeat is, uh, the best book about the defeat is Jeremiah because he was there when the temple went down. And that was in 586 B.C. And we just, we, like I was there. But um, we came out of the period of fasting that the Jews had at the, um, in which they celebrate last week the destruction. They go into the solemn fast about the destruction of the temple, even till this day. 
they remember the destruction of the temple. It was so vast, hence you have the book of Lamentations. It talks about the mindset. And, oh, I'm not going there. Okay, so we have all of this, and then you have the poetic, which are the wisdom books, dealing with various forms, and the books of the biblical prophets, warning of the consequences of the turning away from God. And it, what's very, very interesting is that when you get into the prophets, there is a juxtaposition that deals with, and you've got to be very careful because it talks about the Masonic reign, which is after the rapture of the church. But it gives you the, the book of, so I'm sorry, during Solomon's reign, the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles gives the boundaries, uh, a pre-showing of the boundaries of the Masonic reign, of how much territory that the Jews are going to have. And it goes from the Euphrates all the way down to the, well, now it's called the Suez Canal, but all the way down into Egypt. And it shows to you what God is going to give to Israel. Okay, so anyway, okay, so it was during the reign of Hezekiah of Judah in the 8th century B.C. that historians believe that what would become the Old Testament began to take form. Let me tell you why, okay? When Sennacherib, I believe you, I remember one time you preached that message, uh, Pastor Cooper, Sennacherib and Rambat, I can't pronounce his name and I'm not going to. Okay, and it came to the temple, and it was a, surrounded the walls of Judah, and, so, uh, and, and Hezekiah prayed. Well, Jews always had a chance to look out for certain things. So it's about that time where they took all the scrolls and put them all together. When you read also the book of Kings, you also need to read the book of Chronicles. You should not read them separately. You put them all together. And then when you put them all together, you begin to see something. Okay, the northern kingdom, which is called Israel, okay, they did not serve Yahweh. They regarded not Yahweh. They, uh, uh, Rehoboam, the son of Nebat, made two altars, one in Shechem and one in Bethlehem, to keep the people from going to the temple. So they're totally out the picture. But when you read about the uh, king's, in the book of, I mean, when you read about the kings of Judah in uh, the first kings, the second kings, first chronicles, and second chronicles, you begin to see something. They, there's this phrase, and they did good in the sight of the Lord, or they did evil in the sight of the Lord. What that shows to you is that during the reigns of the kings that did good, what they did was put together like uh, Superintendent Stone, he was all over what I'm saying. Uh, the writing, the redoing of the, of the Torah and the redoing of all of these other books that were there at that time because parchment doesn't last that long. Uh, case in point, the Gutenberg Bible that was printed in the 1400s you have to handle it with gloves. And it has to be in an oxygen-free environment. So imagine an ancient parchment. So every time a king did good, they went in and did the ceremony because there is a ceremony that's done and there's a prayer that's done. And then if they make one mistake, they have to rip up everything. It's like having a under, Underwood typewriter. If so those of you that are like my age, uh, you know, if you, before uh, whiteout and everything else like that, you had to pull the paper out and rip it up because you made a mistake and start all over again. Okay, then, okay, we talked about the Apocrypha. Okay, and so here we go. Now, we at 1400. So on all, after 1400, the temple was destroyed in 586. They come back again 70 years later. I'm sorry, roughly about 40 years later because the destruction, I mean, the captivity started somewhere around 605 B.C. under King Jeroboam. So you still have the word of God. All right, that's all they had. They had parchment. 
All right, and they had to carry the parchment on their shoulder. That's how big it was, and that's how heavy it was. Can you imagine coming to church every week with a parchment on your shoulder? Thank God, amen, for the Gutenberg Press. All right, so now we get to, now, here's the conflict of dates, okay, because we are now in the Gregorian calendar, okay, dates are different. But at the time of Jesus' birth, this is hilarious, you know, for historians. Jesus was born in 4 B.C., but we know that B.C. means before Christ. But he was born four years before Christ. That's the fluctuation of, of the Gregorian calendar and the Julian calendar. The Gregorian calendar is by Pope Gregory. The Julian calendar is Julius Caesar. Okay, so the New Testament canon, and the, we call it a canon. It wasn't a canon in the beginning. It was a group of letters. Okay? So we call it a canon because there was a criteria set that, you know, by the, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but by the time it decided to be a book, it was individual letters. And when it came into it, there had to be a criteria. How can we put all of this together? And in the meantime, you know, where the Lord works, the Satan always liked to show up. And so what he was doing was putting together um, other writings. And hence, you know, those that are not saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and have discerning, that they call them the lost books of the Bible. And how come you don't read the lost books of the Bible? Now, those are the New Testament books because they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. That's why we don't. You know, it's not in there. So all of these lost books of the Bible, when you consider the canon, when the canon was finally put together, in, I mean, finally, all 66 books, was in the Council of Trent in 1546. When it was put all together, okay, these books did not line up. Number one, it wasn't written by an apostle. Okay, that's one, that was the main thing. Who wrote the book? Thomas. Okay, we have the Gospel of Thomas. All right, now, does that represent Jesus Christ and that he is, number one, the Son of God? No, it doesn't. Okay, so, oh, bye. You know, th that's the way they did it, okay? So, now we have these writings, and they attribute the apostles circulating among the earliest Christian communities. None of the lost gospels was ever sent around to the different churches right, or to the different people. What they were were found in a jar. All right, so you, you can just say, basically say that, you know, what that is. All right, and perhaps the uh, collected forms. By the end of the first century A.D., Justin Martyr, okay, mentions memoirs of the apostles. That's what it was called, the Gospels. That's what it was called uh, in the beginning, the memoirs of the apostles, because the apostles are, have written down their experiences and what they've seen. And in the book of Luke, chapter 1, and he says, uh, Former treaties have I written unto you, O Theophilus. So it, this is Luke's experiences as he was traveling with uh, Paul. All right, and by the third century, we have Origen, who had been using the same 27 books as in the present New Testament canon. That's 300, okay? And in the Easter, a letter of 367, Anatheus, Bishop of Alexandria, all right, gave a list of the books that would become the 27 books of the New Testament. You got to bear in mind, I'm, I'm jumping here because the Old Testament was already in place. When you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find that the Old Testament was, and the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Old Testament was already considered scripture. Okay, I mean, Jesus did open up the, uh, look, he was in the synagogue, and he opened up the, um, the, the Bible says he found a place. Now, to give you an example, remember I told you he had the, the Torah, and he had to pick up the Torah, put it onto a table, so, so to speak, which was a pulpit. That's why the pulpit, that's why we use the pulpit. In the book of Ezra, we, Ezra used the pulpit, so we use the pulpit. So he opens it up, he found the place. That means he had to roll up one part and unroll the other but he found a place where it was written in the book of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. All right, here we go. 
So, the New Testament books. First, you have the Gospels. Each of the four Gospels in the New Testament narrates the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as so dramatically and so informative that uh, Pastor Stone had did, the Old Testament speaks of Jesus Christ. And matter of fact, just to jump backwards, the stars speak of Jesus Christ. Okay, and so the word gospel derives from the Old English God spell. Okay, meaning good news. Okay, and the, the gospel, the good news, was considered good news of the kingdom of the Messiah. But the Jews rejected it. Now, here's something interesting. Again, you got to read it with understanding. And I was taught as a very young age, before you open up your Bible for your daily reading, you need to pray. Okay, you got to pray. And not a prayer, a prayer, you know, like, now I lay me down to sleep. You know, that, no. You got to take the time out to pray to give you the understanding. But when you read the Gospels, there's a time that Jesus was talking about the kingdom. And then there's a time when Jesus, excuse me, stops talking about the kingdom and begins to talk about the church or the new covenant because the Jews rejected Jesus, so therefore they rejected the kingdom. But since they rejected the kingdom, Jesus says to Peter, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Church, that word church was never used before. If you chronologize the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at the things that he did, that was the beginning of the church. That was a prophecy that was coming forth. All right? So the Gospel of Matthew ascribed to the Apostle Matthew. The Gospel begins with the genealogy of Jesus and the story of his birth. Now, when you look at the two genealogies, the one in Matthew and the one of Luke, the one of Matthew deals with Joseph, the one of Luke deals with Mary, and you see where they all come together under the descendant of David, okay? Mary is Nathan, and Joseph is obviously David and Solomon, okay, because he's the king, all right? The Gospel of Mark ascribed to Mark the Evangelist. This gospel begins with the preaching of John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. The Gospel of Luke ascribes to Luke the Evangelist, who was not one of the 12 apostles, okay, but mentioned as a companion of the apostle Paul and as a physician, okay? The gospel of John ascribed to John the, uh, uh, the evangelist. Now, this gospel begins with a prologue of eternity past, which is very theological because the two, okay, again, super thin the stone, he used the word, it's called dispensation. Okay, and dispensation is a time in which God judges man. But the Gospel of John deals with a dispensation before man was made. So then therefore we have eternity past and we have something that's called the dispensation of angels because the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So how did the earth come without form and void if there was no earth in the beginning? Okay, long story. Okay, but then we have the three, these Gospels, uh, they contain similar accounts of even the events of Jesus' life and his teaching due to their literary, liter, 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 or lit, okay, forget independence. Okay, uh, pardon me. Okay, now I'm able to get it up. Now, the, just as in the Old Testament it has history books, the, the New Testament has history, and that's the book of Acts. And we can attribute the book of Acts uh, from A.D., let me see, Jesus lived 33 and a half years, so you subtract four because of the Julian calendar. So A.D. 31 to roughly about uh, A.D. 60 because Paul died, but around about A.D. 68. But he was, in, he was on his way to Rome. 
Uh, and if you was in the 8 o'clock class, we had a marvelous class in the book of Acts. Okay, so the Acts of the Apostles is a narrative of the Apostles' ministry and the activity after the death of Christ and the resurrection. Then you have the epistles. The epistles of the New Testament are considered by the Christians to be divinely inspired. Okay? Now, that's what you got to be. You got to believe it. They, you got to believe it. They are divinely inspired. God breathed on these men through the means of the Holy Spirit, and they began to write. And you've got to believe it all. All right, that's my favorite word in the Bible, all. All. And so you got to believe it all. And because it talks about how to live and how to um, live this walk and how to actually talk to you how to witness boldly. It talks you how to live, how to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, how to believe that you might be saved. It talks about it all. All right. So, and again, in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, it says, therefore, O man, thou art without excuse. Okay, so here we have, okay, the, the Pauline letters and the book of Hebrews, very interesting book. And because it shows you the ministry, the ministry of Christ now. Okay, okay, because Christ is in heaven and he's ministering. He is our advocate with the Father. He's the mediator between God and man. And it talks about how that's done. Then you have the general epistles. And then you have, again, the book of prophecy the uh, book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, so now let's go to our church fathers. And this is important because what they did was they began to put together all of these letters into one thing. They divided the, uh, well, they joined the, 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 the canon of scripture. Okay, now first one I want to show you is Polycarp. He was martyred in uh, A.D. 155, and he quoted from the 16 New Testaments and referred to them as sacred scripture. All right, next slide. All right, during the mid-2nd century, Justin Martyr, whose uh, writings span a period of from 145 to 163 A.D., mentions the memoirs of the apostles, uh, which we call the Gospels, and which were regarded as on par with the Old Testament. So all this time from uh, the writing of Moses in roughly about uh, between 1440 and 1400 B.C. up until 163 A.D., we have the four Gospels considered sacred scripture, and we also have uh, the Old Testament, and they are both on par with one another. The basic reason is because they talked about, or they, the central figure was Jesus Christ. All right, so then Justin quotes uh, uh, from the letters of Paul, First Peter, and Acts in his writings, and in his works, uh, distinct references are found to Romans, First Corinthians, Galatians, and all the rest of them. Next slide. Irenaeus of, of Lyons, around A.D. 180, quoted over 1,000 passages from all but four of the five New Testament books and called them the scriptures given by the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, next slide. Tertullian of Carthage used almost all of the New Testament books. They were equated with the Old Testament and he referred to the majesty of our scriptures. Next slide, uh, by 240 A.D. You see, I, got, I started from the beginning. Now I'm after 240 A.D. I still got a couple of centuries to go, don't I? Uh, Origin of Alexandria was using all 27 books and only those as scripture alongside the Old Testament books. Okay, so you see now the um, Apocrypha was not considered way back then in 240 A.D. The Apocrypha was not considered as sacred. What they are considered is, because we've got to give them a label, um, it's history. Okay, now there are two books that I love and I wanted to plug it in there um, because the book of Joshua in chapter 10, you find out are these not written in the book of Jasher. And um, then there's this other book, it's called the book of Enoch. Now the book of Jasher, that's not a name. Don't try to look him up, okay, because he didn't exist. Jasher 
is another word for righteous. So it's the book of the righteous. But again, they didn't consider that um, inspired. It was history. But it does give you history in regards to what had happened between the book of Joshua goes all the way back between the Garden of Eden up until uh, Samuel. So it's it just history. The book of Enoch, humans do some dumb things. But um, during the intertestament times, they added the books of Enoch. So book of Enoch, chapter number, two, uh, the second book, third book, and the fourth book is what is called Jewish mysticism. It's called Kabbalism. Uh, but the first book they is not. But it's so far out there, our comprehension is like, no, it has to be. So in order to um, alleviate any confusion, they left out all four. But the, the, the interesting thing is, is that in the book of Jude, he quotes from the book of Enoch when he says, and I see, saw him coming with 10,000 of his saints. That phrase, the 10,000 of the saints is coming from the book of Enoch. All right. So it, going back to 240 AD, origin of Alexander used all 27 of the book, and he considered them as uh, scripture. All right, here we go. I got to move fast. I can't talk as fast as Superintendent Stone. So, but all right. So the, the councils, it's, it's interesting how the Lord preserves his book. And when you look at history, we look at history, you know, uh, from two points of view, for the good and for the bad. Uh, and it's a bad thing that Rome got into and messed up Christianity. It's bad. It's horrible. Because what Rome did under Constantine in the 300, the early 300 A.D., when Constantine became a emperor, he saw a way to unite the Roman Empire. What he saw was the sun, because he worshiped the sun, he worshiped the sun. But inside the sun was the cross. So modern day Christians think that Constantine was saved because he saw the sun, but inside the sun was the cross. But when you think about it, Shouldn't the sun be inside the cross instead of the cross being inside the sun? And then what they did as Rome was conquering other areas of Europe, they adapted all of the other religions of the pagans into Roman Catholicism. So hence, what they do is you can't find it in scripture. But... The, at the Nicene Council, they invited, the bishops invited Constantine to the um, council, and he had his entourage with him. He had his uh, people, his adjuncts, first and seconds, and all of that, and they came down in all of their clergy attire. Hence, that's where they get the clergy attire. And uh, so... He, he just sat there. But in the Council of Nicaea, all right, what he wanted to do was give 50 Bibles to all of the churches, the 50 churches in, uh, the, in, in Constantinople. The problem is they didn't have a Bible. Remember, it wasn't one book yet. So there was a commission to get 50 copies of the Bible for the church at Constantinople. That was the first time they tried to get a Bible together. So how do you get a Bible? You set up a, a perimeter. Only books that talked about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Jesus Christ as God. Okay, that was important. And you have to see whether or not uh, the apostles were, whether these books were written by the apostles. Okay, so you got these two books. You've got, I'm sorry, you got these two sections. We already believe that the Old Testament is scripture, so now we got 27 of the New Testament that are scripture. Now that was in 325 A.D. It should have been left. All right, we should have moved on. But there was another council. 
All right, there was a council at 382 AD. It was a council at Rome. Then St. Augustine in the Council of Hippo at 393 AD, reaffirming the previous list. All right, that's like going to a meeting to have a meeting, which you could have sent an email. All right, then you have the first council of, of Carthage at 397 AD. Then another council at Carthage at 419 um, AD. Now, the next one is quite interesting because you kind of think that we, we did say 27 books, right? You kind of think that all of them were included in, in the, in the uh, canon of Scripture and so that the Bible is complete. Did you not know that the book of Revelation did not make it until 1549? And the, be, the reason being that it really didn't make it because it was too far-fetched for them. But that first chapter was what got it over. That first chapter that talks about Jesus Christ. That first chapter that talks about our statement of first, number one. We believe that there is one God eternally existing in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That first chapter talks about Jesus Christ and gives him glory. Okay, so you can't deny the glory of Jesus Christ. So, okay, here's Jesus Christ. Here's Jesus Christ triumphant in chapters 20 through 22. Here it is. So put it in there. It didn't happen until the Council of Trent in 14 and 1549. All right, so that's the foundation. Now, in quoting uh, one ancient writer, here comes, the, here comes the history. In quoting the one ancient writer, uh, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his, sea, his feet upon the sea and rides on every storm. In like manner, it was only the good protective care that brought the Holy Bible that we know today in existence. Okay, now, uh, church fathers, English role in the Holy Bible. And I'm getting somewhere because every time I say that, I can't say it. I can't speak of this without a smile on my face, but I'm getting to it. First of all, we have John Wycliffe, all right, is a Oxford professor, scholar, and theologian, and a translator uh, for the first English Bible, uh, which was completed and one of the first uh, to feel the wrath of the Roman Catholic Church. And, and there he is on the screen. All right, Wycliffe was accused of being a master of errors and condemned as a heretic. All right, uh, even though they could not capture him in life because of his powerful friends, 44 years after his death, the Pope ordered his bones to be dug up and scattered his ashes in the room. Like, that's really going to do something. Okay, now... But you have to understand, during this time, they had something called purgatory. That you, if a loved one died, you had to pay the church to uh, get them out of purg purgatory. And the Roman Catholic Church determined the amount that you would have to pay. Hence, when you go to Italy and you look at all of the splendor that's there in the Vatican City, it was paid for by people who really believed that they were pulling their loved one out of purgatory. All right, so then you have John Wycliffe. But while John Wycliffe was alive, you have Johann Gutenberg. Johann Gutenberg invented the printing press in the 1450s. And the first book to ever be printed was the, language, the Latin language Bible was the Vulgate, okay? Gutenberg's Bibles were beautiful as each page printed was later colorfully hand illuminated. All right, next person is William Tyndale. Okay, now we're going from the 1400s to the 1500s. Uh, he holds the extension of being the first man ever to print a New Testament in the English language. And Tyndale was a true scholar and a genius so fluent in eight languages that it was said one would think any of them to be his native tongue. Now, what's interesting about all of this, outside of the common factor, that if, we, if you look at the slide, we can't read that. 
because the English language has changed over the centuries. So what I'd like to do is to ask of you, how many of you went to public school? Okay, if you went to, thank you. And how many of you, while you were in public school, and especially in high school, read William Shakespeare? Okay, now, William Shakespeare's writings was before the King James Version. And you didn't need any type of inspiration, any type of indwelling of any spirit to be able to pick out a sonnet from William Shakespeare memorize it and or write a paper or a paragraph about what it was talking about okay so but every 50 years the language changes so look at this what I have on now are called pants years ago they were called trousers years before that they were called knicker knicker not the other way okay so it shows you the transformation of, of the English language. So, why I'm going to show you why the King, I'm going to show you my prejudice, but I'm going to also show you why the King James Version is important. Okay, so Tyndale was hunted down by the emissaries of King Henry VIII and those of the Roman Catholic Church. In order to elude them, he, Tyndale, uh, was compelled not only to move with great secrecy, but to assume other names. On the 6th of October, in 1536, he was led to a place of execution where they tied him to a stake. And Tyndale cried with a loud voice and fervent zeal, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. That's all he prayed because they were, he was about to get burned. And that was his dying prayer. And then he was hanged and his body was burned. Lord, open the eyes of the king. Remember that. He's praying for the king of England. Okay? And then there's John Collette. John Collette, uh, we're still in the 1500s. Another Oxford professor and the son of the mayor of London started reading the New Testament in Greek and translating it into English for his studies at Oxford. People, this reminds me of the, the passage in Amos that speaks about that there will be a famine for the word of God. The people of England at the time were so hungry to hear the word of God in the language that they could understand that within six months there were 20,000 people that packed into the church and at least that many that were outside just to hear the word of God in their language. You want to talk about how we got the Bible. All right, then there's King Henry VIII. Now here's where I smile, okay, because again, God moves in mysterious ways and his wonders to perform. He's thinking about us. The Lord had us on his mind. Even in the history of man, he had us in the 21st century on his mind. I'm going to do, hear this. All of the royalty of England, including King Henry, was part of the Roman Catholic Church. Y'all got to bear with me for this, okay? Now, following the difficulties with Rome over his, vo over his divorce with his wife, Catherine, because he wanted to divorce Catherine and marry Anne, okay? And Ma Anne was his mistress. But the church said no, okay? You're with me. You got to follow this, all right? Now, where, does the, where, where do we fit in that, okay? Here's the king of England having an affair, and he wants to divorce his wife. And the Pope says, no, none of y'all, none of them that I just mentioned are saved. King Henry ain't saved. You know the Pope ain't saved. Catherine ain't saved. And the mistress ain't saved. But that has something to do with us. Okay? Here we go. <laughs> All right, now, now, following those difficulties, King Henry split from the Roman Catholic Church. He's like, all right, you're not going to give me a divorce. I don't want to be Catholic anymore, and I'm taking England with me. And that's exactly what happened. Hence... When, even today, they have the Church of England, or it's called the Ang Angling Angelican Church in England, because it's split, but it looks just like the Catholic Church. Their robes, their services, everything that they do, but it's not Catholic. All right, so what he, King Henry requested that the Pope permit him to divorce his wife and marry his mistress. The Pope refused. King Henry responded by marrying his mistress anyway. 
okay? And he put, uh, and thumbing his nose up at the Pope by renouncing the Roman Catholicism, taking England out from under Rome's religious control and declaring himself as the reigning head of state. So hence, whoever's the king and or queen is either the Pope, I'm making up a new word now, or Popess, because it's Queen, queen Elizabeth now. All right, they're head of the church. This new branch of Christian church, neither Roman Catholic nor truly Protestant, became known as the Anglican Church or the Church of England. Now, his first act was to further defy the wishes of Rome. Here's the king. Now, remember, Tyndale's prayer was, Lord, open up the eyes of the king of England. So, his first work was uh, to defy the wishes of Rome by funding the printing of scriptures in England. The first legal English Bible. This was the answer to William Tyndale's prayer. Now, interesting about this Bible is, is that the people were so hungry for the word of God, they chained it to the pulpit. That's how hungry they were. All right, so it wasn't yet available for everybody. Okay, and it was roughly about 16 inches high. Why? High. So when you open up the Bible and like the slide showed, it was heavily illuminated. So if you were trying to take it, you would get caught easily. All right. So then there's Miles Coverdale. Okay. Miles Coverdale and John uh, Rogers had remained loyal disciples in the last six years of Tyndale's life, and they completed the work. Then there's Thomas Cramer. All right. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury hired Myers Coverdale to request the King of Eng uh, King Henry VIII to publish the Great Bible. That's, what I, that's the Bible I'm talking about. All right, it became the first English Bible authorized for public use as it was dis uh, distributed to every church, chained to the pulpit, and a reader, that was a job, you know. You get paid for it. That, you get paid salary by the king. The reader was even provided that the illiterate could hear the word of God in plain English. Then, uh, King James the first. Interesting story about King James. Before you were saved, how many of you ever heard of Bloody Mary? Okay, that's a drink. But it's also a person. It's named after the person who killed everyone that wasn't Catholic or tried to. That's why she got the name Bloody Mary. Queen Mary was against England going Protestant. So anybody that was Protestant went either to jail or, or was later executed. Queen Elizabeth didn't care one way or the other. All right? So, but Queen Elizabeth at that time, I'm sorry, yeah, did not have children. So when she died, there was nobody to inherit the throne for the King of England. So what, she, what they did was, everybody has a council, everybody has a conference. Go find enough somebody related to her, okay, that it can be king of England. So they went up to Scotland. So James I, Prince of Scotland, became, no, James IV, King of Scotland, became James I, King of England. So here's a new king. What do you do? You bum rush him with all of these uh, requests. One of the requests was, can we put this Bible into English? Okay, so now the leaders of the church desired a Bible for the people with, with scriptural references. The King James Version of 1611 was the first Bible with references. Okay? All right, and so he says yes, and... From 1604 uh, to 1605, the scholars engaged in private research. He, he got the scholars together. In 1607 to 1609, the work was assembled. In 1610, the work went to press. And in 1611, the first of the huge 16 inches tall pulp pulpit folios, as it was called, known today as the 1611 King James Bible came off the printing press. 
And starting just one later, one year after the huge 1611 pulpit size King James Bibles were printed and chained to every pulpit in England, uh, printing then began on the earliest normal size printings of the King James Bible. These were produced so individuals could have their own copy of the Bible. Now, where am I? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, here we go. Now we got the translators because these people came together in a group of eight, basically, if you do the math. But there were four schools. There was one in Westminster. Um, there was uh, one in uh, Cambridge. And there were uh, one in Oxford. That's six, right? Okay, for six companies. Two in Westminster, two in Cambridge, and two in Oxford. And they were divided up. Genesis through Second Kings was translated by the first Westminster company. First Chronicles through Ecclesiastes was um, the second. That was in Cambridge. Isaiah through Malachi by the Oxford. Okay, the, now the four Gospels. Acts and Revelation was translated by the second Oxford company. All right, Romans and through Jude was uh, translated by the second Westminster co uh, company. And because... King James said this. I'm going to show you somehow the government can get in front. King James said, now, if you don't include the Apocrypha, all right, you're going to jail, and I'm going to fine you. So the people didn't want to go to jail, and they didn't want to get fined, so they put it in there. That's it. I'm going to get to the Apocrypha in a minute. Okay, so the fact that the Apocrypha books were separated out of the Old Testament and put after it indicates that they did not consider it equal with Holy Scripture. In latter editions, it was dropped altogether. That's why we don't have it in our Bibles now. Okay, now, uh, so then you have uh, Lancelot Andrews. These are the translators. All right, he, and I'm, I'm giving you the translators of the 1611 Bible so that you can understand and, and no, getting past these wild accusations that they were drunk men and they didn't know what they were doing and all of that. These were learned men. All right, Lancelot Andrews was the head of the Westminster Company which translated Genesis through 1 Kings. William Bedwell of the same company was well known as the greatest Arabic scholar of the day. He was the first who promoted and revived the study of the Arabic language and literature in Europe. Okay, he was the first one to present a lexicon of seven different languages, which included Hebrew, uh, Syriac, Chaldean, and Arabic. Then there's Dr. Miles Smith. He is the author of the translator to the readers. Now, when you look at, you can even Google it, um, the preface. The King James Bible had a preface or an introduction, and he wrote it. All right. He was so conversant in Chaldean, Syriac, and Arabic that they were familiar to him as English was. His knowledge of the Greek and Latin uh, fathers were exceptional. John Hamar uh, of the Oxford Company was a noted scholar in Greek and Latin. John Boys of the Cambridge group was a most distinguished scholar of all the translators, and his father taught him Hebrew when he was five years old. And he was admitted to St. John's College in Cambridge when he was 14. Dr. John Reynolds was a Puritan who was first suggested a new translation, had a reputation as a Hebrew and Greek scholar. And he had read and studied all the Greek and Latin fathers as well as the ancient records of the church. John Saval was of the New Testament Oxford Company, who was one of the most profound, exact, and critical scholars of his age. Okay, and now here we go, the translators, the spiritual content. We're in 1611 now, okay? Scholarship is not everything. You can be smart and still be dumb and spiritually. All right, the translators of the Bible is always affected by the spiritual character and the faith of the translators. 
an unbeliever does not translate the Bible as a believer does. Now, and I'm going to say that again because we're going to get somewhere. An unbeliever does not translate the Bible as believers do. An unbeliever does not translate the Bible as believers do. All right? This is the problem with many of the modern translations. Some of the translators were not qualified to spiritually, uh, qualified spiritually for the work, even though they might have the intellectual ability. All right? But these men considered scriptures to be inspired work of God, and to them the Bible was very special, was a very special book, and they handled, they handled it accordingly. Yet they knew also that this special book could be properly translated and profitably read and studied only when God worked in the hearts of its translators and readers. Hence the scripture, we believe the Bible to be the only infallible written word of God. And we also believe that the Bible is inspired. God breathed on them. God breathed on the writers. God breathed on those that preserved the books. God breathed on the translators. And you got to believe that. Hallelujah. All right, these men were not afraid to go over their work again and again, and again until they were satisfied that they had att attained the best possible translation if they followed the procedure which was laid down for them each part of the work had been closely scrutinized at least 14 times yeah. okay. okay okay now okay that they sought an accurate translation is further indicated by the fact that the italicized they italicized every word that did not have a corresponding word in the original, so which is obvious because it's a different language. But how many modern Bible versions do that? You see, you see what I'm saying? They, they just put it as this is it and this is it. Okay, now here's the thing. The King James Version has something that no other Bible has. And that is, it's the Bible. It's a book that men died for. That men died for. Okay? All right. It is not strange, therefore, that this Bible comes down to us, okay, 409 years later. Remember, God had us in mind. Okay? And stained with the blood of the martyrs, those that dared to change the language because they wanted it to be for everybody. It was in God's intention that the word of God for salvation. How can you understand the plan of God for salvation towards man if you don't understand what the person is saying? And so these men gave their lives. They died for it. Some died while translating. Others died for thinking about translating. All right, and for the men behind the English Bible were such strong conviction that they would suffer imprisonment and death rather than renounce their faith in the Bible as God's written and infallible word. This is God's truth. This is John 17 and 17. This is, the, we're inside the box. Okay, now there are other versions that people do and and my time is running short. The first one is the Noah Webster. You remember Noah, he did the dictionary. And in 1833, this is where we are now. In 1833, just a few years after producing the famous dictionary, he would produce his own modern translation of the English Bible. However, the public remained loyal to the King James Version Bible. Okay, so his Bible didn't have much impact. Then in 1880, England um, planned a replacement for the King James ver uh, Version of the Bible called the English Revised Version, or the ERV. Now, this would become the first English language Bible to gain popular acceptance as a post-King James Version modern English Bible. 
The widespread popularity of this modern English translation brought with it a curious characteristic, the absence of the Apocrypha. So it was not up until the 1880s that they pulled the Apocrypha out of the Bible. All right? So <clears throat> then, let's go on. The American Standard Version in 1901 was America's response to the England's ASV. It was widely accepted and embraced by the churches throughout America for many decades as the leading modern English version of the Bible. Then there was a huge gap. In 1971, the American Standard Version Bible, often referred to as the NASV or the NASB or the NAS, this new American Standard Bible is considered by nearly all evangelical Christian scholars and translators today to be the most accurate word-for-word -word translation of the original Greek and Hebrew scriptures into the modern English language that has been produced. However, some take issue with it because it is so direct and literal a translation, remember it's word-for-word, and it's focused on the accuracy of the word for word that it does not flow easily in conversational English. The beginning, you know, it's a translation of ancient languages. Then in 1973, I need you all to listen. In 1973, due to the flow in the NAV, uh, came the NIV was produced. Now, it was advertised in 1973 as a dynamic equivalent translation into modern English. It was also advertised that it was designed not for word-for-word -word accuracy, but rather for phrase-for-phrase -phrase accuracy. And easy reading, this is an insult, it was for easy reading even to a junior high school reading level. It was meant to appeal to a broader audience and in some instances, those that are less educated, cross-sectional general public. So if you didn't have an education, you can understand this Bible. But it was pushed, it's being pushed now as the best translation without the reason for it, okay? Now the critics of the NIV often call it the NIV for another abbreviation or another acronym meaning nearly inspired version. But that was not, but that didn't stop it from becoming one of the best selling Bibles. In 1982, you have the new King James Version Bible. Now this was produced by the Thomas Nelson Publishers. Now the intent of this new King James Version Bible uh, was the fact that they decided to take out the these and the thous and the thy pronouns, any uh, 16th century English Bible uh, words. All right, now this was an excellent marketing ploy. However, it didn't work because it wasn't enough for them to be able to legally copyright the results. Then we have in the year 2002, the English Standard Version, the ESV, that's being pushed even now a major attempt was made to bridge the gap between the simple readability of the NIV and the extremely precise accuracy of the NSB, uh, NASB. It is rapidly gaining popularity with its readability and its accuracy. The 21st century will certainly continue to bring new translations of God's word in the modern English Bible, okay? So they, there you have it. From the dateless past, God has been writing. There was an old song by an old quartet group called the Dixie Hummingbirds that's talking about my God is writing all the time. And he is. So uh, listen, I want you to know that the Bible that you have in your lap, that's the word of God. That's the inspired word of God that was intended for us to have. It was intended for us even before the worlds were created. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 6, all the way to verse number 9, talks about 
how the Lord had a conversation. I got to come down. I got to redeem man. And it's written of me to do so. To do thy will, O God. And thank the Lord that he did it. He did it in the stars and man corrupted the stars. Okay, man corrupted the stars and called it the zodiac and told us to look at the stars for our lives. Okay, and we as Christians, when the Christianity came about, even when you read the prophets, the prophets talk about don't look to the stars. The prophets talked about don't worship the queen of heaven. Okay, don't look there but look to the word of the Lord. Our God is not made by man's imagination. Our God is not made with wood and with stone. And, he's been, and they've been saying that from the time they came out of Egypt. Even before they came out of Egypt in the 1800 BC, roughly around about that time, there was a man by the name of Abraham who finally obeyed God when he was 75 years old and left Ur of the Chaldees, which was a very... Uh, idolic uh, nation. They worshiped the queen of heaven and everything else. And Abraham journeyed from Ur of the Chaldees, went across westward around the, the tribes of, I'm sorry, the rivers of Euphrates and the Tigris, and then came down south through uh, the borders of the Mediterranean, the cities. And he, the Bible says in chapter 12 that he stopped in Shechem and made a sacrifice to the Lord. Then he went further and came down and stopped at Bethel, and he worshiped the Lord. And there he stayed and worshiped God. Of course, he went to Egypt, uh, you know, because of the famine in the land. And then he came back and went back, and the Bible tells you, he went back to the same place. And there he was again in that same place. And you know what he did? He worshiped the God that called them in the beginning. So here we find God revealing himself. Here we find God talking to the man and revealing himself and showing him that he is God. And then what's interesting is when you give, continue to read, there is a scripture that we overlook because we can't make it out in our modern day times is that when Judah was caught in adultery at the woman that he had the affair with took his rod. But in his rod, there was a testimony that was carved in his testimony. That was, that's the written word of God, of what all that God did for him. How that Judah was of the son of uh, Jacob, and Jacob the son of Isaac, and Isaac the son of Abraham. All of that was in that rod, and that's how they knew it was his. And then we have the Israelites in Egypt in the 14th, 40, 14, well, in the 1440s BC in Egypt waiting for the promise to be delivered and when they got delivered God revealed the word of God to them written written in the hand of stone uh, Cecil B. DeMille says by the finger of God and you see uh, Charleston Heston coming down from the mountain but the whole point is it was written so even back then even though it was the law, uh, it was written for us. And then when Jesus comes on the scene to fulfill the law, okay, in the beginnings of the A.D. under the emperor of Claudius, Claudius Caesar, Claudius, or Claudius Caesar, uh, he says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. He's there. He's there. There is the manifestation of the word that we have today. We don't have Jesus with us in flesh and blood. We don't have Moses, but we have the word of God. We've got it. We've got it. We've got it. We've got it. We thank God for the word. We bless God for the word because it is the word that gives us salvation. Thank the Lord Jesus. And so I end this by saying, hold on to your Bible. Hold on to the word of God. It is by the word of God that we are saved. It is by the word of God that we have eternity. We have salvation. We're looking forward to when the soon coming of our king. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you and give you peace.